Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now, he's one of the biggest and most enduring names in Nigerian journalism, and yet he's not originally Nigerian, but adopted Nigeria as his home for the last 55 years. And in that time, the inimitable Lindsay Barrett has shown himself to be an A-list columnist, author, playwright, poet, broadcaster, and commentator who's honed his craft over a long and worthy career, opening the Nigerian imagination to a new world of possibilities explored through the pages of newspapers, books and magazines, and via radio and television, and also photography. He's just two months shy of becoming an octogenarian, but the intellectual spark he lit over his 55 years in this country is now something of a roaring flame. What an extraordinary life Lindsay Barrett has had. But why did he choose to live in Nigeria, in preference to his home country of Jamaica, or places like the UK and the US where he could easily have settled? Well, I'm delighted to say that the man himself is here to answer that question, Lindsay Barrett. Thank you ever so much, Lindsay, for Thank joining us. Us. Why did you come to Nigeria and what made you decide to stay here? Of all the places you could have lived and settled in, including your country, Jamaica, the UK, where you had access, the US, all places that you could have settled in if you wanted to. Well, Charles, first of all, let me say that the decision that I would at some point land in West Africa came to me very early in life. And you were just in your 20s, weren't you? A teenager, you're going well, into your 20s. Much before that, my grandfather told I, I used to take care of my grandfather when I was about five years old. I would sit with him in the morning, scratch his head. And, and that so was in Jamaica? In Jamaica. Right. And my grandfather lit the flame of an interest in Africa by telling me that his own parents came from the Gold Coast, Ghana. So the truth is, and this is something I'm always afraid to tell Nigerians, the truth is that when I decided to come to West Africa, I had originally wanted to go to Ghana. But on my way, I stopped in Sierra Leone. Right. I was a guest of the vice chancellor of the university who was the writer Abios and Nicole and after I spent four months working with the extramural department and this was in 1966 in 1966 right uh, Abios and Nicole told me that the way I lived my life only one country in West Africa could accept me and that would be Nigeria <laughs> what does he mean he the said, way you live your life he said uh, I should check out Nigeria said that's the only place I believe you can live happily right I didn't know much about Nigeria but I knew about JP Clark and Wale Shainka right. and others I in other words a country that could ever. accommodate the things mm. that you were you were doing and you well, wanted maybe to do. he probably thought I was because I had run into a little trouble with the government in Sierra Leone right I had you challenged the government. challenged right. some of their uh, beliefs. And so when Nkrumah was overthrown, I realized that uh, what I wanted to do in Ghana would have been hard to do. And he then told me, you will enjoy Nigeria. And I got to Nigeria remembering that I had been told this before by J.P. Clark. Mm. Because I, I became involved with African broadcasting through something known as the Transcription Center in London. Yes, I, 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 to, I know the Transcription Center. I used center, to yeah. do weekly programs. Yes, yes. For they African used to come in records and things. You know. Yeah. So uh, since I had already built up a little audience in Africa, I decided, I interviewed J.P. Clark, and after I interviewed him, he said to me, why are you staying in this cold city of London? 
you would enjoy Lagos. So when Abiy Hussein Nicole told me the same thing, I decided to just check it out. But originally, I came to Nigeria thinking I'd spend one month. And that was the most I gave myself. I had intended to go back to London, back to Paris, actually. But on getting here, Nigeria was in crisis. And I went to Ibado, where I was asked by the Ibado directors to run something known as the Umbari newsletter, Right. if I could start it for them. So I did that. And that was the time, and this is a part of my story I'm going to now put in a book. Because it is now, after 55 years, I look at it as, I think I've been forced to go through an ordeal. <laughs> 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 because what happened was in July, of the same year I came, July, July 1966, 1966, there was the second coup. Yes. I was a member of a talk group in, uh, in Professor S. N. Udom's home in uh, the political scientist in Ibadan. Mm. And every time we met, I was always starting a quarrel because I told them that I didn't like the idea of military coups and the fact that we had a military government. And I didn't know much about Nigeria, but what I knew was the Saudana's name had always been the name of a great African leader mm. as far as I knew. Whatever problems Nigerians had with him, I found it strange that this man had been killed and we thought that the country would just go on beautifully. And I used to argue this at Ibadan University. So when the second coup happened, I told them, look, this is terrible. Your beautiful country is now going to be run by boys in khaki mm. and so on. And S.N. Udom now told me that it was a corrective coup, and that within that a is year, the second coup the was, second a coup was designed was a coup. to correct the first one. The first coup, right? And that by the end of a year, we'd be back, and we would have a a democracy again, and all that sort of thing. So right? I believed him, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know really. Well, that's a fascinating story, but it's quite extraordinary, really, that at the time you came into Africa, you seemed to be dogged by political issues. I mean, you got to Sierra Leone, you fell out with a government, clearly a government that was fairly repressive. You then wanted to go to Ghana, and then there was, Nkrumah was overthrown. Mm -hmm. And you were coming to Nigeria and got to Nigeria at a time when there was political turmoil. And unfortunately, I, w were, I had just started writing for West Africa magazine. Mm. West Africa magazine up to that time had almost always been written by Englishmen. Yes. You know. And I felt that we uh, Africans should be the ones talking about ourselves. But did they then co-opt you into becoming a sort of war correspondent? Not really. I, I made friends with David Williams, a great old man, Englishman, who ran the place. And I spoke to him on the phone from Dakar. Mm. during the World Festival of Black and Negro Arts where I was a delegate. And he told me since I was going further down, he would like to see my impressions. So I wrote one or two very rudimentary things for him. And he seemed to like them. Mm. So he was publishing them. But one of the, the problem I got in, in Sealone is typical. I took a picture. I had become a friend of Albert Magai, the Prime Minister. Mm. And at the opening of a parliament, I had gone with him. And I stood behind him and took a picture of him leaning on the parapet, 
looking down at the soldiers opening the parliament. And when it was published in West Africa, I had nothing to do with it. Right. I think K. White Man put a caption, said, looking at the future with a question <laughs> mark, because three countries had yes, had yes. Coups in West Africa. That's very interesting. And that was why I got in trouble. They, they saw it. Somebody sent it from London. No, but I mean, the Prime Minister asked me, what did I mean? I said, well, I only sent the picture. So he said, well, we've got to move this man out of this country before he does something else. Yeah. But I mean, would it be fair, though, to say that you've been quite outspoken in your journalism in Nigeria and in Africa? Well, I've tried to. I tried to have a firm view mm. of the need for equity, unity, and uh, development of the people. And although I have been very friendly with members of government and I've worked in government, well, I worked in government during the Civil War. Yeah, we'll come to I, that. In I, I must admit that what I have tried to do is to tell the truth. And you certainly have done that because, I mean, I, I've followed your work. Um, apart from during when you worked in Nigerian radio with a lot of the South Africans and all the rest yes. of them during apartheid yes. and, and used Nigerian radio to educate people about the evil of apartheid. I mean, you've also worked in the Niger Delta with all the stuff around pollution and, and all of that. Um, so, so very sort of critical aspects of, of Nigeria. Um, and that's made you politically and culturally famous in this country. <laughs> well, Charles, it was almost by accident. To tell the truth, um, I now realize after 55 years that when I came to Nigeria, I really knew nothing. Mm. And some of my decisions when I was younger, if I had a choice today, I may have taken a different decision. Was that was one of those decisions, the decision to stay on in Nigeria? Um, <laughs> well, I should hope not, because I, personal issues arose. Yeah. I have many children, and I've decided very early on that even though my first wife left me, that because the children were mine, I was going to stay. Right. And I've stayed in Nigeria really because of my children. So in many ways you were forced to stay. I've been forced to stay, <laughs> but I forced myself to stay. Let me put well, it Well, I, I have to say that is a very, very responsible thing to have done. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, uh, beyond your career, which has been absolutely glittering, as far as the literary world is concerned, that is something to be commended. Well, I wish some of the mothers of the children would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid I can't speak for them because I well, don't know what happened. Well, at, the at truth midnight. is, I have been very lucky. In the last 21, 22 years, right. I've had a very wholesome marriage. And uh, that has made up, in a way, for my earlier right. uh, aberrations. Okay, well, um, it's a fascinating story. Stay with us, please. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Jamaican poet, author, playwright, journalist, and photographer, Lindsay Barrett, who's been living in Nigeria for the last 55 years. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyugolo. Today we are at the uh, taking a peek into the extraordinary life of Lindsay Barrett, the Jamaican poet, author, playwright, journalist, and photographer, who this week marks 55 years since he first came to Nigeria and never left. In that time, through lived experience, but also through the power of his journalism and the wonderfully demanding scratch of his pen, 
clatter of his typewriter and now the clicks of his computer. He's witnessed ethnic and religious tensions, a civil war, military rule, and a return to democracy in Nigeria. All of it cast into sharper relief by his journalistic and creative brilliance, but also by the passage of time. And today, just two months shy of his 80th birthday, he still leads journalism from the front, is as sharp as a needle and as intellectually rigorous as anyone can be. And Lindsay Barrett is still with me in the studio. Great to see you, Lindy, uh, Lindsay, and, and thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And what I wanted to ask you is this. How do you think Nigeria has transformed since you've been here? Has it changed for, the, for better or for worse in the 55 years that you've been in this country? Well, Charles, I wouldn't like to give a standard answer, let me put it there. Uh, whether it has gotten better or worse. Well, we'd like you to no. give us a considered answer. But uh, definitely it has faced more crises than I thought was necessary when I first came. But what, were these crises self-inflicted self crises? Self-inflicted. Right. Uh, and some, I think, highly avoidable, but we've gone into them headlong. Mm. One of the reasons why I took part in the Civil War uh, as on the federal side was because when the propaganda started, I was told it was commonly felt that it was a religious war, it was a crisis that would split the country into Muslim and Christian and mm. so on. And what really surprised me as that I was very young, as I say, and naive, was when I discovered that it wasn't really what we were being told. And that it was a regional issue. And that, in fact, the federal side claimed to be fighting for the restoration of unity. And I thought that was a very good objective. Mm. But whether we've actually achieved what we fought for is my big problem now. 55 years later, I feel that we may have achieved unity by force, but whether we achieved equity in our society, I'm very doubtful. And uh, that has worried me a lot mm. in my, and is worrying me a lot in old age. That's a very that interesting analysis. When they talk about restructuring, it is, it goes right back to what occurred that led us to the Civil War. Because maybe at that time, the true restructuring should have taken place. So I take it you, you are uh, an advocate of restructuring. I am. Definitely. Charles, one of the reasons I stayed in Nigeria, to tell you the truth, I, I hope people won't feel that I took sides, but the truth is that I found that the people of the Niger Delta, the people of the East in general, <laughs> are very much in their behavior and their, their cultural approach to things reminded me of the West Indies a lot. And I felt that I had come among my people, a bigger market, so to speak. So why not stay? That was after the Civil War, mm. I found that. But one of the things I also discovered was the more I found out about the Niger Delta, from which all the oil comes, the more I realized that the governance of the country as a whole was not unified. We, 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 I, it, it became so obvious to me, so I made it my duty to start advocating a new order of resource control. And why any part of this country does not realize why that is necessary is beyond me. But I've spent 55 years mm. shouting about it. Maybe my children will inherit 
It's, it's very but interesting. That, the, that has been a problem for me. Yes. It's very to admit that I've seen this flaw get worse. Mm. That's, that's a very I important point that, that you make there. And um, let me just take you back to the Civil War. Um, because you, you, you became a part of the information machinery of the government, didn't yes, you? Yes, I mean, yes. I think actually at the end of the war, you became the head of information or something no, for, no, I was for the East head Central throughout State. The war. I left immediately the war ended. Mm. I told Mr. Asika, my boss, that. That's what Babi Asika, yes, who was the administrator the of East Central, East Central State. State. Right. I was his director of public enlightenment and information. Mm. And the whole idea was because I had written a number of things trying to clarify the crisis in Nigeria for foreign papers. And himself and Alhaji Ahmed Joda asked me to continue. And I agreed, especially because I remember the meeting we had in which somebody had written a radio talk mm. and said, started it by saying the trouble with the Igbo man <laughs> in Nigeria. And I told them I would not participate in anything that could write something like that. So they said, write what you think you should. So I now wrote that we should be calling our brothers to come back and promise them that the problems that drove them would not be repeated. And they said, this is a good idea. So you go to the east and take that line. <laughs> so that's what I did, <laughs> you know. And, and how you were there for a period of time. I was time. there throughout the war. Yes. To the end of the war. I made a film after the war of our reconciliation efforts. Mm. And then I left. Fascinating. But um, the thing is that uh, I had a very good friend from the north. His name was Amino Abdullahi. And he introduced me to M.D. Yusuf. And M.D. Yusuf became more or less my mentor. Mm. That's a well-known name in, in this country. And, and I mean, in the course of the time that you've been in Nigeria, obviously journalism, you know, being a journalist during the war during military rule and all that sort of thing. Have you found yourself up against the Nigerian authorities at all? Have, have you rubbed them up the wrong way? Once or twice so I had a little, a few little problems when I wrote some columns. I'll never forget, uh, I, I once wrote a column when General Gawan, who is a very close friend and definitely one of my mentors, when he made a statement that the problem with Nigeria was the youth. Mm. So I wrote a column saying, well, he's the biggest problem because he was a young man. <laughs> <laughs> he was still in his 30s. <laughs> so, so I heard the E department, which was headed by my good friend, right. M.D. Yusuf, went looking for me to pick me up <laughs> in Ibadan. I but you, you might have got away with quite a lot of things because they didn't think I, of you I as I was Nigerian. actually sitting in M.D. Yusuf's house when the gentleman who went to look for me in Ibadan came to report that they were unable to find me. <laughs> so M.D. turned to him and said, do you know who you are looking for? He says, yes, he knows you. He can see you. You know him if you saw him. He said, yes, sir. <laughs> and M.D. said, and who is this man sitting there? <laughs> So what did he do briefly? Uh, and uh, then he suddenly said he was very sorry. So MD said, well, okay, the man is now with me, so you can go. <laughs> I have to say, Lindsay, it's been fascinating talking with you. I could talk with you forever, but thank you very yeah, much you indeed very for much coming. Much Lindsay sense. Barrett. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.